hello everyone, welcome to another episode of 10 for the Chairman. Uh, for those of you who haven't watched it before, this is where I take 10 questions from our subscribers uh, in general and try and answer them as best I can. Uh, for those of you that don't know, the subscribers are the uh, portion of our community uh, that kick in a little extra money every month that allow us to do a lot more uh, community uh, content. Uh, this show, uh, Women's Hangar, uh, Jump Point, uh, which even though subscribers uh, get first, eventually a lot of the articles and background information that we have in Jump Point, which is 50, 60 pages each month, which is pretty impressive magazine size, um, trickle down to the community as a whole. So um, this is our, our way of um, giving back to the subscribers a little bit and saying thank you um, uh, for enabling us to do all this. Um, so uh, I'll get right to it. The uh, first um, question of the 10 comes from Slack R. Uh, in the dogfight module, where is our hangar located? Are we already in space on a station? If so, how do we get the ship out of the hangar without creating a vacuum? That is a good question, but um, the concept with the dogfight module is actually that you're flying uh, essentially a simulation inside your hangar. So what will happen is you will be in the hangar, you'll get inside your Hornet or um, any of the other ships that um, we'll have available for Dogfight V1. Um, and if you don't have any of those ships, we'll have, give you a loaner ship to fly in Dogfight V1. Uh, but you'll, you'll climb in and you basically fire it up. And at, the, at that point, your HUD comes up and creates a uh, sort of a joining a simulation uh, interface. Uh, so you know we've mentioned uh, arena mode as uh, a part of the game where it allows you to uh, practice flying around, fighting with your friends, but not taking your actual ship out into space and, and risking uh, you know, loss of equipment or life. Uh, and so that is uh, what we're calling Arena Commander. And uh, you know, it's a bit of a nod to a game I may have made in the past. Uh, but you sort of connect up with there, and it's all done in fiction that you're connecting up to a battle net. And, you will fight against other people. So what happens is you step into the ship in your hangar, connect up, and then sort of the outside of the ship, once you've connected, you come back out, and bam, you're now out in a virtual uh, space flying around dogfighting. And once you've finished the battle, you return to your hangar, you'll be back in your hangar. And of course, there won't be any bullet holes on your hangar because it was all a virtual simulation. Um, but it is the beginning of the stub of the arena mode that will be in the game, which will be throughout uh, the game, so it's kind of one of the uh, the features that um, you know will be useful, and I think longer term people would probably use this feature to sort of I don't know do esports or challenge each other without having to uh, you know lose um, you know their precious cargo or precious ship. So uh, so we don't have to worry about a vacuum at the moment because it's all virtual. Uh, so the next question next question comes from Kalashkinov, who asks. Given all the focus on Oculus Rift, will similar time be given to technologies like Track IR and Cast AR? Uh, do you expect basic head tracking functions to be available for the dogfighting module? So we've already announced that we're going to be supporting Track AR, so that's definitely on our list. Uh, Cast AR, um, I'd have to uh, take a look at because we haven't announced um, uh, support for it necessarily at the moment. But you know, if something's cool, I mean, we're pretty. Uh, peripheral agnostic, we want to support a lot of uh, different options, um, you know, whether it's, you know, HOTAS outfits or keyboard, mice, gamepad, regular joystick, uh, you know, Oculus Rift, Track AR, uh, you know, rudder pedals. Um, so, you know, that's part of the spirit of PC gaming. So uh, CryEngine is actually quite good at having a lot of different input stuff. So you can, in the dogfight module, when you'll play, you'll be able to have um, you know, your, your HOTAS set up and a mouse and a keyboard and all the rest and all be flying it all using all at the same time if you want. Um, so uh, we'll do that. As far as the head tracking uh, functions for the dogfighting module, I'm not sure about D dogfighting V1. We'll probably try to have the Rift be working for it because we already have the Rift working in the hangar, but we're really trying to do some extra stuff on the Rift to have p proper stereoscopic dual rendering as opposed to um, sort of a um, post uh, stereoscopic rendering. And there's still some head lag issues that we're dealing with. We've made it better, but there's some we're dealing with um, that are down at the engine level that we're sort of working a little bit with Crytek on. But I don't think we'd have track AR um, and stuff ready for the Dogfight V1, but that would definitely, that is definitely on our list of stuff to work on and stuff to do. Um, so that you could see that coming in um, along the line when we sort of, when we start to patch stuff. Um, okay, so next question comes from uh, Jomanda who asks, what do you envision the end game to be for the industry side of the game? 
uh, especially for players that are more focused on that aspect. Well, I mean, first of all, I, I hope there isn't any particular end game in, in uh, Star Citizen. I mean, I don't think people think there's a necessary end game in, in uh, EVE. Maybe it's running your corporation, but then there's always someone trying to take your spot or push you off that top perch, uh, which is pretty much the way I think Star Citizen would work. So, I mean, I, you know, I think if you're into sort of the economy side and you want to be sort of more a entrepreneur and build up businesses or industries, um, that's really going to be around, uh, you know, buying and owning like a production node, which essentially is kind of a factory, and then running that in terms of making sure that you're getting the right raw materials and you're doing well, and then perhaps you can expand and maybe you can buy another production node somewhere else and sort of build up your own economic empire. And in that case, I think you would probably be spending a fair amount of time uh, sort of managing the resources and hiring other people to do a lot of the sort of legwork like you know, bring cargo from A to B and have people to defend it and all that sort of stuff. So I would say that would be sort of the high level game if you were more interested in, in that level of the game versus just the flying around combat side. Next question comes from Elijah Zulus Parsons who asks, will I be able to set pilots organizations aggression status like red slash foe, orange slash pirate, uh, green slash friendly, gray slash neutral, blue slash friend, etc. in relation to myself, my organization. The game tracks all the relationships between the organizations, either the game defined ones, which would be the sort of NPC ones, or the player uh, ones, and it tracks whether you're friendly or you're not friendly, uh, and all of that sort of will translate into when you're flying around, in your radar, you'll sort of see the friendlies, you know, like the default would be friendlies would be green and the hostile would be red. Uh, so that all sort of the status of uh, relationships between organizations, uh, whether it's NPC or player, is mapped to um, friendly, not friendly, neutral, all that kind of stuff. And that maps to colors that are uh, in your um, HUD. So I think uh, it's automatically handled would be the best way to say it. I mean, you can, of course, in your organization say, I'm not friendly with this organization. And then, of course, when you see them, they will come up as enemies or hostiles to you. Uh, so I guess to that level, you could uh, potentially set the aggression status. Um, OK, so the next question comes from Shogun, who asks, will the Mastang and other ships not yet available for pledge be made available before the Alpha. It looks pretty cool, and I would like to add one alongside my Aurora LN and Cutlass. We are working on um, you know, all the ships that we've announced at some level. So some are in the concept stage, some are in the modeling stage. Uh, but there's a lot of work happening. Um, you know, we've got a lot of artists, but there's even more work than we've got artists. And uh, also for the dogfight, there's a lot of extra sort of work that comes into building all the different damage parts and models of the ships and LODs, uh, which you know you don't necessarily see the benefit of until, say, you're in the dogfight. And so there's a fair amount of artists that are focused on that. Um, but the, the idea is, as these ships get built and put in the engine, then we'll make them available in the hangar, and then you can fly them. And then when they're available in the hangar, the concept would be that you should be able to you know, have them and put them in your, you know, you'll be able to pledge for it and put it in your, um, uh, your hangar. And then uh, also, once we have all the damage states and the LODs, you can um, do the, uh, you'll be able to fight with them in the dogfight module. So I would say that they will probably be available before the game is finished, definitely. Probably not by dogfight V1, but sometime uh, thereafter. Um, so um, anyway, so the Mustang we are working on right now. So the next question comes from uh, Garosian, who asks, if I happen across some cargo that has fallen off the back of a freelancer, is it fair game to any who can pick it up, or is it considered stolen? Merchandise be automatically identifiable by the authorities and other players. Um, so that's a good question. Uh, we've actually had a debate about that because we're uh, in the process of fleshing out the cargo uh, system. Uh, you know, so that would be like um, kind of what the standardized sizes of the cargo are, uh, how you get the cargo into your load your ship, how you unload it, um, how you be able to, how you're able to dump it in space. If, say, a pirate's like, give me your cargo or else I kill you, uh, how are you able to bring cargo in from space back into your hold? So we've sort of been working on all those aspects. Um, uh, it's pretty cool design stuff. Um, so uh, one of the things we were talking about was, 
you could have a fancier sort of basic cargo container. So think of our basic cargo containers as like containers in the real world right now. So like if you see like, uh, you know, that gets put on trains or container ships or trucks um, drive around, normally like say everyone makes a bunch of TVs in, I don't know, South Korea and they put them, pack them up and put them in this big container and then the container gets uh, taken by truck to the train station. The train station takes it to the boat, puts it on, uh, the boat comes across here to America, they unload it and then it gets put back onto a train and then goes to a local distribution center and then goes out on a truck and then it's in Best Buy or wherever your electronic store or Amazon delivers it to you. So um, we have the same concept of containers uh, just because it's, it's simpler to have uh, uh, uniform sizes and then there can be bigger ones and smaller ones but they all sort of have volumes that are defined that our, that our holds are built for. Um, and the fancier one, so if you want to invest in like a more expensive container, we were considering having sort of like tracking, uh, you know, like LoJack on it or something. Um, but most of them won't have that. So most of them, uh, if you, if the cargo is floating out in space and, you know, you come across it um, and take it in, then it's sort of kind of at that point it's finders keepers unless it's sort of marked. Um, obviously, if you were the person that, that, that forced the cargo to be in space by uh, a legal pirate attack and you're in, uh, you know, well-regulated or policed areas uh, and someone saw you do this or, or the ship that you attacked got its distress call out, uh, then you probably will be wanted for the Piracy Act. Um, so, I don't know. They, there you are. So, I, I guess if you happen to find some cargo floating there because of some other battle and you pick it up, you're, you'll, you'll be okay as long as it's not sort of tagged with uh, the sort of more fancy container stuff. All right, next question uh, comes from uh, Garskull, who asks, regarding star maps, will organizations be able to apply their own markers and notations on the star map so that all or selected members of the organization can share information, such as resource nodes held by allies, enemies, troop movements, etc." So yeah, I mean, actually kind of one of the ideas uh, with your navigation map is as you fly around, so, so um, most navigation maps have sort of the basic trade routes or locations noted down. So, you know, like the main planet in the system or whatever, but there's a lot of the system that will not be mapped in your basic navigation map. And if you fly around, this is kind of one of the things that explorers can do is if you fly around in a lot of areas, you may find an asteroid field that isn't on the navigation map or something else in the navigation map. And then you essentially map that on your map and you can, you know, you have it as your sort of localized uh, navigation point or coordinate uh, area of interest and you can write your own notes about it. And then you can share that with members in your organization. So like if you've discovered like an asteroid field that has like some rich minerals that are good to mine and no one else has seen it, you can like broadcast that to everyone else in your organization and say, hey, let's come here and let's do this mining. And everyone else won't know about it. Now, of course, you would be able to say, sell some of that to a general um, you know, cartographer company because you know, think of, uh, the navigation computer is just like a, a Monday GPS, right? And you get an updated disk of, of like uh, locations to drive in. So another option is explorers could go around mapping stuff out and then when they've mapped out um, the system fully, they can go and sell that and that can become for purchase for a large group of people in the same way that we talked about for uh, jump points. Um, so that's all sort of things you can do. So you should be able to share um, sort of map information uh, between um, the members of your organization. Uh, the next question comes from Otak Kulan Dingla. Kulan Dingla. That's a, quite a mouthful of a word. Can you share any of the plans for Orgs 2.0? As an Org leader, I have concerns about how multiple Org membership will work and how I can manage my people. Unfortunately, I'm not uh, the best person to answer that because that would uh, really be uh, Benoit at Turbulent. Uh, but the stuff that we've, we've talked about um, for Orgs 2.0 is, you know, multiple organization membership is a must because we're not going to have a sort of friends list per se. So basically you'll be members of multiple organizations and one of the organizations obviously could be, hey, my friends. Um, but there'll only be one sort of primary organization and then the other organizations will be affiliates. So the primary organization uh, that your member is sort of, that's kind of the authoritative boss one and their primary one, whoever runs it can say, well, if you're a member of this, of this organization, I won't accept you over here. You can't have that as an affiliate. So you can sort of dictate as an organization, okay, it's okay to be, you can be part of my organization and a member of the Merchants Guild, that's okay. But you can't be part of my organization and a member of the, you know, the 
the Pirates Guild or whatever it is. I mean, not that the Pirates would have a guild, but um, that's sort of the, the, the approach you could do. Um, so I think as an org leader, you can sort of control uh, who uh, are sort of members of um, different organizations. And there's some other kind of cool mechanics that we haven't quite revealed yet in that that I think uh, will make uh, some fun. I mean, all I'll just say is, you know, there's, there's a, I think there's a concept that um, there could potentially be sort of a, uh, a sort of, I don't know, special op side of an organization where you can do some sort of uh, clan sign spying stuff and misrepresent some stuff and anyway so we're going to put tools on both sides because we think that could be a bit of a meta game and it'd be kind of fun um but we're not revealing too much of that just yet so anyway there you go so next question comes from zen grin who asks given how the universe instant server has been set up to match make on the fly and determine who will see who when entering a given area of space are we guaranteed to instance with pilots in our friends list and organization preferred method or will there be some gameplay mechanics such as creating a squadron or something similar required in order to force that to happen no so so the the, the way the match the whole point of having organizations and being members and like i just mentioned on my previous answer um, essentially your friends list would be an organization it would just be sort of a less formal organization of here's my uh, list of friends and that would probably be something you would keep as an affiliate organization when you're a member of a primary organization that would be something like i don't know uh, the Imperium or something like that. Um, so what it does when it match makes and you're flying around, it, it, it kind of looks around and says, oh, well, you know, uh, I'm going in here and these are the other members that are part of your um, you know, organization friends list. And it tries to put people together that you know. It tries to put people together that uh, you know, you've designated as a person of interest. You can also, before you start out, you, like, you jump out or you go out, you can sort of um, basically hook up and say, yeah, we're, we're flying as a group. So, you know, me and this friend and this friend, this friend, this is our little unit that's flying as a group um, to let the, the game know that you're flying together. Um, and then I'll, it'll do things like determine, um, you know, based on ping, if uh, it would be another criteria. Of course, if you say I'm flying with this group, uh, that takes priority over everything else. Uh, and then also, you know, kind of what your preference is in terms of uh, combat, right? So whether you want to be sort of doing PvP or, or, or want to be fighting more sort of NPCs and PvE. And of course that depends on what area of space you're in, but um, you know, we're not going to match up someone that just wants to be doing PvE in a fairly safe area with someone that just wants to do hardcore PvP, because um, that wouldn't necessarily be a lot of fun uh, for the PvE side. And on the PvP side, um, there'll be plenty of opportunities to fight other people because we're, we're making sure that there's a lot of um, benefit to being in sort of the less regulated uh, areas, so like more, ri more risk, more reward, so to speak. Uh, but all those criteria are factored in when uh, we're, we're basically doing the instancing and, and so we sort of decide, well, the, this group of players is coming from here to here and they may intersect this other group and then you just sort of run through the matchmaking criteria and if you determine that they should see each other, um, you create an instance, and you put the group into it, and then let, it, let, let the conflict resolve itself, and then they go back onto their journey. Um, OK, so last question comes from Commander Keen, who asks, question about PC touchscreen support, not tablet. With PC OS such as Win8 now natively supporting touchscreen, has there been any thought put towards allowing the same support in Star Citizen directly? No, not yet. I'm, probably be something that we would consider, although everyone sort of hates Windows 8 here. Uh, so we're mostly uh, developing on Windows 7. Um, I have it on like a few of my laptops and it's kind of cool to scroll around, but most of the things that have the, the touchscreen stuff don't usually have the, you know, they're not really the, they're the small sort of tablet-like or netbook-like uh, computers, which obviously don't have the computing power to, to do Star Citizen. So that's not necessarily been a focus of ours. Uh, not saying that we wouldn't potentially do some uh, exploration and support of it down the road, but I would say that would be kind of a later uh, task. I mean, already the game's got a huge amount of stuff to get done, and we've got so many features to do that um, that, that would be one of the less um, critical ones and would probably fall to once the game. Uh, has finished and maybe we'll take a look at it and you know who knows Windows 9s could be you know much better it's always the it's always the odd ones that are the good windows and the even ones suck so um, we'll see all right so that's been another episode of 10 for the chairman thank you guys for listening hopefully my answers were 
uh, informative uh, to all you out there. And again, I want to thank all the subscribers for um, basically providing the funds to allow us to do a lot of this community content and the backers and the community in general for supporting the team, helping us build uh, this hugely ambitious project, which we're having an immense amount of fun doing with um, all your guys' participation. Um, so I will check you next week. Thank you very much. Bye.